Middle Tennessee at Alabama. Alabama right now will not announce a quarterback. Uh, we know they're a very talented team, but we don't know what's happening in quarterback. They're favored by 39 here over Middle Tennessee. The total is 51 and a half. So they're expecting this game to be a, a struggle for, for Middle Tennessee to score some points here, Bear, where you're leaning. And it probably will be a struggle for Middle Tennessee to score some points because they're they're a better defensive team than they are offensive. But if they can score seven, I think they have an excellent chance to cover. So I'm going to take the Blue Raiders plus the 39 at Bryant Denny week one. And you mentioned Alabama's quarterback situation. It's a tough spot for Tommy Reese and, and, and Nick Saban in this first game is you've got three guys Publicly, you're saying you don't know who, who it is and who ultimately you're going to play in your start. So you're probably going to play all three guys. You really, you really can't not show anything in your playbook because you need to see who's going to excel in certain situations. But at the same time, you don't want to show everything because you have Texas next week coming in, and you don't want to give the Longhorns any kind of film advantage and any, any type of scouting report that way. They they know what's coming, so it's a very tough spot, I think, for for Nick and Tommy to what plays are we going to call, who are we going to play, for how long? And if you go back and look historically, now there just may have been massive talent differences where Alabama couldn't help but win fifty five three, but at the same time, he doesn't normally like to run the score up on these overmatched teams, so. 45-7, I think, would, uh, would would treat me perfectly. And I can see with the total around 51, that's kind of what the odds makers are expecting. You find it silly when these coaches can't announce any depth chart. Nick Saban refused to put out a depth it's chart dumb. for this game. It's it's dumb, right? Like, it doesn't matter. It's not going to change what happens to Middle Tennessee. I don't get it, Bear. It makes no sense. I want to fade those it, teams it, whenever I say that happened. And, and it's like the, the Utah-Florida game tonight earlier in the week. Oh, Cam Rising's atop the depth chart, and people all say, oh, Cam Rising's going to play. <laughs> Never play. It, it, it's chicanery. <laughs> we, we know, we've known for months that Cam Rising is not playing tonight. So people, people, people need to uh, take that information with a grain of salt. So do you think Bama plays two or three quarterbacks? Because your point about the rotation, especially with Texas coming up, next week is a, is a pretty good point, right? Because, it, look, as, as a former lineman, like, you you want to work with one guy. You want to get in that rhythm. You want him to see the same things you see. And when you rotate so many quarterbacks, you don't get that together. You don't get that cohesion together. And then you have to go play Texas in, in two weeks, and Texas is good. And so I think Nick, Nick Saban is going to try, I, I don't know if you agree, Bear, to – limit reps like i think he's gonna try to get one guy a half another guy a half maybe and maybe has to work a different way but i would imagine he doesn't want to go three ways in this game or two ways in this game yeah yeah i i would think that you'd probably have it in some kind of order where milrow and re and uh and buckner probably get equal snaps and maybe you bring in uh simpson kind of late to give him a drive just to get his his feet wet because because i, I think you're right because not only are they undecided there they're a young team throughout with a lot of young skill players around there. So like it's going to be, I, I think as the year goes on, we're probably going to see more of a, uh, a classic Nick Saban classic offense where maybe they're a little bit more run oriented and maybe they're relying a bit more on that defense as well. How much is the new clock rules, which we know change in college football, right? They're running the clock now in first down for 56 of the minutes kind of look at, at the big underdog and say, hey, man, if, if Alabama runs the football enough, the clock just kind of bleeds out. Are you taking that in consideration at all in any of your wagers early in the season? I, I am taking – I'm erring on that side, assuming that these games will be lower scoring and that there will be fewer yeah. plays. Yeah, I think what, – what is it? We're expecting, what, like seven seven fewer plays, I, I think is yeah. what the, the the average was like the expect. And that's that, – that, that could be a, a yeah. touchdown a game. Who knows? But, but I think until we know for sure, I, I think you do need to go into it and say, okay, it will be a fewer points. Group, but at the same time, I think the odds makers know that as well. And they're probably baking that into their lines. I would imagine. So let's get your, your last game here. Uh, it's a battle between Fresno State and Purdue. Both teams going with transfer quarterbacks, a new coach for Purdue and, and, and Ryan Walters, longtime coach, Jeff, Jeff Tedford still at Fresno. Purdue's here by three and a half. The total is 47 and a half. And Bear, I think you're going against your favorite play last year, which was taking the Fresno State Bulldogs. And Jake Hayner, your boy, Jake Hayner's gone. 
Oh, yeah, say Jake Hayner is gone. I can no longer play Fresno State. By, by the way, I cannot wait until he actually starts in the NFL and, 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 and we can pat each other on the back just because being the honorary members of the Jake Hayner fan club for years. But I think this line move has gone too far. I, I, I get maybe taking Fresno State at six and a half or seven where this line was earlier on this summer. But here at three and a half, I'm going to lay the points with Purdue. Okay, this is not a Purdue team that is close to as talented as the team was last year, the one that got to the Big Ten championship game. Rahm is gone. Connell is gone. All the most of your skill players are gone. But at the same time, you mentioned Ryan Walters. I think he will come in and sure up that defense. And Graham Harrell comes in to, to call the offense. And he's brought in Hudson Card from, from Texas, who is familiar with Harrell's kind of formations and, and that type of offense. And I think he's going to flourish in this offense, finally getting an opportunity. Even shorthanded, I think Purdue will find a way in that offense to put up some points on a, a pretty good Fresno defense. But at the same time, you, you hit on, on Harrell. Not, not Harrell, I should say Hainer, the other quarterback with an H in, in this game. But Hainer not being there. But he's not only is he not there, Mims and some of the other guys that were on that Fresno offense last year, they are gone too. So I could see this potentially being a lower scoring game. And I think because of that, I'm going to lay the points with Purdue because I think they probably have better overall talent on the defensive side of the ball. And I think they have more ways to score points with a pretty uh, creative Harrell calling the plays. Does it matter to you at all that you have a first-time coach at Purdue and then a long-time coach in Jeff Tefford? Or is this, or is this really just about the talent on both teams? It's more about the line move than anything else for me. I, I'm reading this as a discount on Purdue. A anytime you see a big move on a trendy underdog like this, I think at some point there's a, there, there's a, there's a line where you have to say, okay, at this point, there's too much value. It's kind of like the it's closing line value basically in reverse where I'm, I'm going to take the favorite at a reduced price against where the line the line opened. But but that makes it's a good point that you make with with, with Tedford, a guy being around against the head coach making his uh, that, that is not an angle that I that I thought of. That is not something that I thought about when handicapping this game. So now you're giving me something to think about, but I still am going to take Purdue. What do you what do you feel about about buying points? Would you buy a half point down to three here or leave it at three and a half? I just I hate laying three and a half and especially in the NFL. I, I would almost never lay three and a half in the NFL. But in college football, there's a little more leeway. But does that three and a half scare you? That hook seems to always bite me in the butt, man. I think with so many two point conversions now, it's lessened. It's interesting because you always say you're worried about laying three and a half. And I've had multiple conversations with Chris Andrews, uh, the great bookmaker over at the South Point. And I, I said to him, like, why, why does it feel like three and a half, like play the, play the fit in two and a half? And he, and he said, I'm like, he's like, you're right. It's counterintuitive. Lay the three and a half, take the two and a half, and more often than not, uh, you, you, you're, you're going to be right. Because I think the majority of people think exactly the opposite. Like, oh, you're saying if the, you lay the two and a half and you win by a field goal? Then, then, then you win, or okay, you 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 take, you take the three and a half, and you, and you lose by a field goal, you win. So it, it feels kind of obvious, for lack of a better word, that that's the way you should play it. Which is why I think the counterintuitive, the way you wouldn't think to play it, is probably the way that you should. Now I've totally confused you. 